as people trickle in, we're going to do this. It's going to be pretty short and fun. Um, the overview is we're going to do this as a uh, quick PowerPoint discussion of two new ETFs we launched. And then we'll open this up for Q&A. Uh, we can talk about anything. I'll do it almost like a podcast macro with Meb or uh, webinar Q&A sort of uh, Mebisode where we can just chat about anything y'all want. So throughout the presentation, um, now, anytime, if you guys have questions, put them in the Q and A, uh, and we can certainly ask, uh, talk about them at the end or, um, even in the chat is fine too, but tell you what, why don't we go ahead and get rolling and, um, we can get started, uh, here. So we launched two new funds. Uh, this is pretty exciting for us because it's been a little while, you know, for the over the past decade, we've been doing about a couple funds per year. We try to be a little counter cyclical. I know it's tempting to uh, try to launch funds when something's hot, like it's AI now, or maybe all the income uh, option writing funds, perhaps. But uh, on occasion, we'll launch funds that are a little against the current. We did a factor based REIT fund that's BLDG during the pandemic, and here's two other funds uh, we'll dig into during uh, during this chat. Both of them in January. Um, for those who don't know us, and I'm, I'm sure uh, most of you uh, do, if you've gotten here today, you know our my day job is managing Cambria funds, so an ETF issuer with almost two and a half billion under management, fourteen funds, over 140, 50,000 of y'all crazies invested with us. Um, we uh, we take that very seriously. Um, we publish a lot of research, both on uh, you can find on the Cambria funds website as well as curating outside research over on the ideafarm.com. About 100,000 uh, email subscribers to that. It goes out once a week on Sunday. If you don't get it, uh, you should sign up. It's free. I uh, promise you can always unsubscribe uh, as well. And this gives us our top three podcasts each week. And if you like uh, listening to podcasts, we got about five years curated of the top investing podcasts on Spotify. You can watch me pick fights on Twitter, of course. Um, and, and still blog on occasion, although most of it tends to get a little more long for me, uh, and those white papers end up on all the various sites. Uh, the podcast is has been and continues to be uh, a lot of fun. We have a great lineup coming up, so you guys don't want to miss. We recorded one yesterday with a $60 billion money manager and another one tomorrow. It was a couple hundred billion. Uh, I think both these names you guys will recognize uh, and they're going to be a lot of fun uh, as well. So so certainly hit subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Um, a lot more of y'all seem to be participating on LinkedIn these days. So we definitely have content there. And I'm told now a Substack and even a TikTok. So don't, don't quote me on that. Um, the two things we're going to talk about today are in the red brackets. You can see the rest of our lineup and it tends to coalesce across a number of themes. Obviously, Probably the one we're most known for now at this point is shareholder yield, but we still have three allocation funds, two tail risk funds, a few thematics, one hedged equity fund, a global value, and now new category fixed income, uh, which uh, which we'll get into here in a bit. Um, so the two, and we're going to kind of go in order of familiarity uh, and and simplicity to complexity and new are uh, the Cambria Micro Small Cap Shareholder Yield ETF, MYLD, and the Cambria Tactical Yield ETF, TYLD. So uh, those will, uh, two very different topics, but then certainly throw some stuff into the questions uh, on any topic, and we'll get to at the end. So quick, you know, for those of you who aren't familiar with shareholder yield, and I imagine most of you are, so this is going to be a very quick cursory overview but you know, we wrote a book on shareholder yield over a decade ago, launched SYLD over a decade ago with this uh, insight that it's, look, it's not a unique insight. People have been talking about this concept of, they, they used to phrase it either total yield or net payout yield or shareholder yield, but really it's this concept of uh, including all the ways that a company can pay back its shareholders through not just cash dividends, which is the one everyone loves, and is focused on, but also net share buybacks, as well as net share reduction. And all three of these move the levers in favor of, uh, of the shareholder. And so combining them, at least historically speaking, was a wonderful way to factor weight a portfolio. We found it to be the premier factor when we published this book. Um, and then certainly out of sample, it's been, uh, it's been a fantastic uh, factor as well. 
for those who follow SYLD, you know that um, it's been uh, really a standout performer, number one fund in its category since inception, which is pretty cool. Um, and then we recently wrote a report uh, comparing shareholder yield to a bunch of the dividend funds. If you haven't seen that, request it, and uh, certainly we'll pass along, but it should be on uh, the Cambria Funds website. But this whole concept underlies this theme that we have done on shareholder yield. And as we've managed these funds, and so we have three, uh, now four, which is SYLD for the US, FYLD for foreign, EYLD for emerging, people will request, keep requesting different variants. Um, no one's been talking about, uh, you know, these concepts of shareholder yield more than Uncle Warren, really. I mean, this this goes back to a 1984 letter. He talks about it a lot in the last two or three uh, annual reports. Um, this one, rightfully so, is mostly um, the theme on, on Charlie, um, but who also talked a lot about uh, how companies allocate their capital. Charlie used to always say, look for the cannibals, the companies eating themselves on share count. And so Warren loves, obviously, companies that are trading blown intrinsic value and doing buybacks. I think the biggest caveat and star over this past cycle is uh, rather the concept that it's not just that you're doing buybacks, which is everything the media focuses on. And if you're the politicians, certainly focused on buybacks, but it's actually the share issuance. And so, so much of uh, not only fairness and meritocracy of our system, but also when people think about portfolios, uh, they tend to ignore share issuance. And so, you know, if you have companies, a lot of the dividend screens, they'll screen for, hey, I got this great three or 4% yielder. But guess what? If you're diluting the, the shareholders 5% of yield, you have a negative yielding company. And so a lot of the tech companies, particularly in the US, have been big, big shareholder diluters uh, over this past cycle. Um, you don't see it as much elsewhere in some of the um, uh, portfolios, but certainly within the US, it's a big concern and something to be uh, aware of, not just the buybacks, but also share issuance. So here's our, here's our three. Um, SYFY EY. EY is actually a five star fund. So this ticker is a little outdated. Um, but all three of these, anytime you have an investing approach, you want it to work most of the place, most of the time. Can't have something that wins all the time uh, everywhere. But uh, it's fun to see that not only have these three performed great, they've done it in three totally different geographies, um, um, you know, not just in the US, but foreign developed and emerging uh, as well. So um, and here's a, a compliance slide, but you can see that, you know, despite many value strategies really struggling against the S&P since inception by three, four, five percent per year, SYLD has eked out a tiny, tiny little edge over the S&P, which um, I wouldn't normally expect a value strategy to do in a romping, stomping bull market. Usually um, value really distinguishes itself, particularly uh, during the sideways and down, which we haven't seen in quite some time. So what's this new one doing? I mean, look, I'm not going to spend much time here because it's actually really simple. It's just think of SYLD, but smaller. So all the same metrics, all the same process, all the same flows, except instead of it being a go anywhere fund, it's focused on the small cap part of the world. 100 stocks, 59 basis points. Um, one unique feature, which we announced, so some of you may have missed this, um, it's not something we're uh, really promoting or changing our materials about. But as we sat around, we thought this was an interesting idea, which was, you know, many of you over the years have said, Meb, I love this fund, but, you know, for various reasons, I'm not going to buy it till it gets to 100 million, 500 million, a billion, whatever it may be. Um, and I say, that's fine, you know, because they say, look, it's if you launch it, it's a 2 million. I don't want to buy 10 million of this fund. It may have big higher bid ass spreads. I'm worried you're not going to support it. I think now these are less smaller concerns that we've been around in business for over a decade uh, and, and are at a pretty um, decent size. But we used to hear this a lot. However, this doesn't fall on deaf ears. And I think it's a thoughtful um, to be able to reward people who are early adopters when funds are small. Um, you know, we've never shut down a fund uh, where people always say, We're worried about you shutting this down. I don't want to get stuck in it. Well, you know, a lot of the big boys shut down 30% or more of the funds they've ever launched. And so, um, but but I hear you. And so what we implemented uh, recently was we said any fund that's under 50 million, which both of these funds currently qualify for, we're going to waive the expense ratio. It's voluntary. Um, it's something we can end at any time. These are all sort of legal compliance things, I should say. 
but the reality is we plan on keeping this forever. Um, we, uh, we plan on keeping it as a benefit to people who are early adopters and funds when, uh, when they launch now, who knows, maybe, uh, both these go to 50 million this month, in which case they'll start charging fees again. But, uh, but for now, all the funds that are above below 50 million, um, uh, have no fees. And that's about, I think it's about half, half a dozen, five funds right now. So same thing, sector agnostic, we cap the sectors at 30%, but really it's the uh, market cap ca uh, ceiling, the way to think about this fund. So it's like, you know, as these stocks get bigger, uh, they're going to bump their head against the ceiling and um, eventually get kicked out. So we'll screen for these small micro cap. And one of the reasons we were trying to get this out really last year, as, as if you look at the Venn diagram of value and what's underperformed the S&P for the past 15 years, which is everything pretty much, but... And then, you know, you have obviously value, but also you have size. And so the size being small cap, you know, is it levels, if you look at these charts, the small cap discount versus large cap, part of this is driven by the cheapness of small caps, part of it's driven by the expensive of the market cap weight, the max seven, et cetera. But these levels are um, comparable, certainly to the late nineties. Uh, so we really wanted to get it out at the end of last year. Um, they had a, a bit of a, a run in Q4, uh, but again, this is a long-term perspective. So we still think it's a pretty awesome time to be interested in small and micro caps in the U.S. Um, you guys have probably gotten used to these charts um, where over time uh, we like to show uh, any fund and you can you can type these into Morningstar and um, they'll give you a snapshot of the holdings. And so we do this for all of our funds and you can find the materials online. Uh, we have a piece that we update every quarter we like called Think Income and Growth Don't Exist, Think Again, where it compares SY, FY, EY to uh, the broad index, but also the category. So MYLD is in the small value category. Um, and we also show the S&P small cap index. And as you can see, the small cap category and the index are, are both broadly speaking cheaper than the S&P 500 Um but MYLD is uh, cheaper than both. Uh, so not just the index, but also the category as well. Part of that is the ability to concentrate. You know, you get some of these funds that get north of 50, 70 billion, and, you know, they try to say that they're a concentrated fund. I mean, it's pretty tough to, to do that at that sort of size. So you can see you got single digit PE ratios, nice price to cash flow numbers, all these good things. We think uh, it looks to be a pretty good time to... Um, um, to uh, invest. I'm going to hit a couple of these questions as you guys ask, because they're specific to these funds. Um, the first one being, uh, why is this equal weighted and SYLD is not? Um, SYLD is equal weighted. Uh, what you will, all, all of our YLD funds are equal weighted, 1%, 100 stocks. However, you know, once you buy something, some go up, some go down. So we let them float intra-quarter, we have tolerance bands where if they get to be way too big, we'll trim it intra-quarter. That's pretty rare. It happens. You know, we were on TV the other day talking about uh, our EYLD fund owns a semiconductor stock that's been a better performer than NVIDIA over the past year. But you don't hear about it. All you hear about all day long, you turn on Bloomberg and CNBC and Twitter, all you hear about NVIDIA, NVIDIA, NVIDIA. Um, and our US SYLD owns uh, not that much in tech stocks. But if you look in emerging markets, it's the number one sector. Part of that is because emerging markets are so much cheaper. So if you look at EYLD's holdings, you'll notice that, for example, um, the top holding is not 1%. It's probably closer to uh, 3 4 5%. But, um, but at 5 those get trimmed back down to intra-quarter. Uh, so on average, yes, they should be around 1%. But you'll see some lower. You'll see some higher uh, as well. Um the funds is the fund standard deviation same as shareholder yield. Well, this one's only been out for a month. Um, but uh, but to be clear, and we wrote a piece on this recently on SYLD because Morningstar was talking about how SYLD had all this great performance, but it was volatile. And I said, you know, again, getting nervous about people confusing volatility with risk. And we, you know, demonstrated that SYLD. Uh, the amount of time it spends in the top two quartiles of performance versus the bottom two, is it a volatility discussion or is it losses? You know, because part of volatility captures up volatility. So if you have funds or investments that go up, um, and it's particularly in a volatile nature, that's a good thing. You want 
high upside volatility. Uh, you just don't want a bunch of downside volatility. And so I think it was mischaracterizing the, uh, the, the intent of what that metric is for. But broadly speaking, one would expect a portfolio of 100 stocks to be higher volatility than a broad 500 or 2,000 stock portfolio. Uh, and one would probably expect a portfolio of small caps to be more volatile than a portfolio of mid and large caps. Man, those, you guys, good for you guys. You got a bunch of questions in here. I'm uh, I'm shocked. Uh, so, you know, I, I think the uh, there's some questions on the range and the bounds of uh, what do we mean by micro and, and small cap? You know, it's that's a subjective topic. I think if you ask a lot of people, say, what's a small cap? Somebody may say, oh, it's like one to 10 billion. You ask someone else, it's like, oh, no, no, it's 300 million to a billion. And it changes over time. There's ways you can look at it as a percentage of all the stocks out there. You could look at it and say, hey, this is you know the bottom two quartiles, whatever it may be. And there's some people who are listening to this and say, Meb, you say micro cap, I think 20 million, you know, uh, bulletin board, pink sheet stuff. So um, I think it, it depends. And you got to also remember that a lot of this investing decision is um, the logic is based on what's going on in the world. So there's times when our funds uh, like, it's it's always easier to discuss EYLD because it it has differed so much relative to the benchmark. For many years, owned very little China, and China being the massive part of the benchmark. SYLD doesn't own much tech. Tech is a huge part of the the market cap weighted benchmark. On and on, because they're agnostic as to where they go with with guardrails. Um, that that opportunity set changes over time. Um, are you able to backtest an equal weighted small cap? Sure, sure. Um, we may publish something there. I mean, again, it's broadly uh, similar to the, all the things we've published over over the past 10 years on the topic. I, we did a, a deep dive into industries and sectors uh, a year or two ago and shareholder yield um, and found all the research to be supportive. Uh, same deal here. Uh, but yeah, we, we could do something. I hadn't thought about it, but we could. Um, we got questions on capacity. You know, one of the nice things about being a quant and um, and drag from trading costs, uh, I love you guys are asking these questions about a twenty six million dollar fund. Uh, you know, I think asking some of these questions on a on a twenty or fifty billion dollar fund is 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 um, a little harder than it is for ours. We're we're tiny, um, but the nice thing about being a quant, so theoretically, let's say this fund, you guys love this presentation, put a bunch of money in, it's ten billion before you know it. You know, um, one of the nice things about being a quant is you can add on some rules that spread this out. You know, if you're a discretionary manager that owns 20 stocks, it's a lot harder. But as a quant, I can say, you know what? Instead of 100 stocks, we can own 150. Instead of 150, we can own 200. And will that dilute the performance a little bit? Probably, but but not much. Now, if I said, oh, instead of 100, we're going to own 1,000, that's probably going to be a, a much bigger dilution. There's also things we can do on the rebalance. So. Uh, traditionally, our YLDs have been a quarterly rebalance, but we say, okay, hold on, where these flows are getting to be a little much. Um, why don't we do a rolling monthly rebalance? So we rebalance, you know, one tenth of the or one twelfth of the portfolio every month. You could even do it every week if you wanted to, uh, uh, but but one fifty second of the portfolio. There's things you can do to spread out the trading, the costs. You know, as a value strategy, you know, these tend to be. Um, uh, you know, value tends to, you know, be be buying what's cheap and sometimes hated, sometimes not so much, but usually uh, it's not something that's like chasing the hottest growth stock in the world. But you guys got to remember, uh, creations, redemptions happen behind the scenes for us. So only if we're trading out of a position will be something that we uh, need to, to do the trading on. Um, Again, uh, the, the ranges on the micro caps, you know, download the fact sheets. We can get into all that. Um, and, and I think it'll change over time as the um, U.S. market cap changes. But I think the expectation will, will certainly be uh, this, that the majority of the portfolio will be in that $100 million range to $5 billion range um, for uh, the foreseeable future. Um, let's see what else. We'll keep going. Um, just joined. Uh, can you estimate what the yield is? Okay, so this question is a little bit loaded, and this is kind of the crux. This is the key question about shareholder yield. Is you know shareholder yield is dividends, cash dividends, the two main parts, and net stock buybacks. And it's hard to find information on shareholder yield on most websites. I got all excited the other day because Morningstar, if you type in a stock symbol, now shows total yield. I said, oh man, finally on the front page somebody's posting total yield. 
Now, I think, and I haven't confirmed this, that they're only doing um, positive buybacks, so not net of share issuance. Because theoretically, if you type in a lot of stocks, they actually have a negative yield. And it wasn't showing any with a negative yield. So my guess is they're not doing net stock buybacks. The easiest way to find the buyback yield is just look at chair, ch change in shares outstanding. So if there's 100, 100 million shares outstanding now, or a year ago, and now there's 90, well, guess what? The shares went down 10 million. That's a 10% buyback yield, roughly speaking. Um, so on average, typically, you know, everyone gets hot and bothered in the US. If, if the broad market is like one and a half percent yield, high yield, let's call it three, four percent dividend yielders. Um, ours traditionally, uh, and I always like to be conservative, but it's high single digit, low double digit shareholder yield coming in the portfolio just on dividends and buybacks. Debt is kind of a whole another complicated topic that we can get to, but I don't like to quote it in the shareholder yield metric traditionally because we did a poll on Twitter said, when you think of shareholder yield, what do you think of? And everyone said cash dividends, net buybacks, not debt. So I, I try to speak to the vernacular of just those two. And of just those two, it's traditionally high single digit, low double digit. So if you compare, it's like, well, 1.5% dividend yield, high yield, maybe three or four or 10. You know, to me, that's the crazy part of this discussion is it's like not even in the same universe. In the US, it tends to be majority driven by buybacks. Okay, so you may show the dividend yield for SYLD of like one and a half or two um, or one, but really it's all being driven by the buybacks. For FYLD and MYLD, uh, FYLD and EYLD, they show about a 5% usually dividend yield. It's so much higher, but that's because it tends to be closer to a 50-50 dividend and buyback split, uh, though that's changing. You're starting to see a lot more buybacks in foreign developed and emerging uh, as well. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll crank on a couple more of these questions on shareholder yield, then we'll hop over to uh, uh, fixed income. We got a question about, um, is the index, if the index is approximately 40% in profitable companies, does the fund have the same number of unprofitables? Um, I'm guessing we don't have any unprofitables. I can't say any, but probably very few. You know, one of the things, if you're paying out 10% a year of your market cap in cash, you have to have the cash in the first place. And most companies are not paying that off the balance sheet uh, just cash sitting around. They're paying it out um, as a combination of earnings. You know, Apple was a stock we held for a decade in shareholder yield, and they did both. They did cash dividends and buybacks, but they just generate so much cash that it's just like pouring out of their ears that they couldn't uh, they couldn't spend it all. They couldn't use it for things. You know, they wanted to distribute some of it, which is the majority of the case. So I think um, shareholder yield correlates very highly with cash flow metrics, price to cash flow evaluation metric, but it's just cash flow metrics um, in general. All right, a couple more and then we'll hop. Um, are there any plans for a global? We get a lot of questions about a global shareholder yield fund. And I'm always like, can you, can't you guys just buy SY, FY, EY in proportion? Um, but we keep getting requests just to do an all-in-one global one. If you guys have enough uh, demand on that, email us, let us know. And we can do one. I'm happy to. Um, I've always just assumed you could do the Legos together and put them together. But uh, but we keep getting asked this question. And then also someone asked for a globally focused uh, small cap fund. We, I, I say this in passing as, as joking, but I said, look, I always joke with someone and say, sure, you seed it with 50 million, we'll launch it. Um, but if you, but if there is a real demand and it's something you're extremely interested in, certainly let us know. It can be about anything. It doesn't have to be about shareholder yield. Uh, all right. So what happens if you remove financials? Um, you know, every decision you make biases the process for better or for worse. Okay. Um, if you do a top down global approach focused on countries, that'll bias you to smaller countries. If you do bottom up, it'll bias you to countries that have more stocks. So on and on and on. Sectors is always funny, like they arbitrarily exclude one sector. I don't think that makes sense. For example, um, looking at sectors over time, you know, rail used to be the entire U.S. sector, uh, almost the entire U.S. market. And today you have an experience where energy is like 3% when it used to be almost a third. And so trying to pick between the sectors, I think, is, um, is not something we want to do. Uh, the, the fact that others do it and competitors do it, God bless them. That's totally cool. Um, and, uh, if you want to exclude financials, um, go for it. You know, I, I, I think, uh, you look around the world financials, um, 
are often a very large percentage of the marketplace. Um, and uh, I think uh, it's not something we agree with, but um, if you want to you know, exclude a sector, uh, how about it? It could be tobacco. It could be um, beer. Those are the two best performing industries in the last 100 years, by the way. Um, it's not something we do. Um, all right. Question, how about a fund that only does buybacks and doesn't produce any dividends? They they have those funds. Um, you also got to be really careful, um, friends, listeners. I always say, I, I default saying listeners because the podcast. Um, if you look at shareholder yield, if you look at dividend strategies, if you look at um, whatever the strategy is, that's a value type of strategy, but doesn't explicitly target valuation. Personally, I think that's a problem. So dividend yield, what is it? You, you invest in high dividend yield companies. Good for you. What do you get? Well, you get companies that on average, they pay a higher dividend. That's in the definition. You get a value tilt. So on average, they're value companies, but also they're junky companies, right? So if you just buy high dividend yield, you get a very tax inefficient portfolio with a slight value tilt, but that value tilt changes over time. It was a massive value tilt in late 99, relative to the oil market, as dividend yields became super um, popular in the mid 2000s, it was actually in line or at a premium to the overall market, which we'd never seen before. So there are buyback approaches. On average, buybacks are, are executed, particularly the big ones, at a valuation discount to the overall market, but they don't explicitly target it. And I think that's a mistake. And so shareholder yield does. We do shareholder yield, then we do evaluation ensemble to make sure the stocks are cheap. The last thing I want is a company that's doing buybacks, that's buying expensive stocks, right? Again, on average, they're not going to be, but there are stocks that are objectively expensive where the CEO just thinks they're cheap all the time. So I think you really need to have that value focus too, is instead of just saying, hey, we're doing buybacks. But I think that also makes the same mistake. Is, is ignoring buybacks does for dividend investors because they're both around half. Buybacks are usually more, but they're both a big chunk of how they distribute cash. And to ignore one or the other, to me, makes no sense. I think you need to look at it holistically um, as well. Uh, all right, so we're gonna wind down the shareholder yield questions. Um, I think uh, we, we get, well, there's a question about the, the net debt pay down and how the debt works. You know, I think you get included in the shareholder yield metric or you can do it in a way we're just trying to avoid over over leverage companies. Um, now, over leveraged companies, it's a, it's a dual edged sword, right? It, it gives you a lot more juice. So you're getting leverage on your returns. They're going to be more volatile and the good times they're going to rip more and the bad times they're probably going to go down more. And so for me, I err on the side of high quality. It's, it's warm and cozy to me much more than highly leveraged. I just don't want to get taken out of the game in a, in a nice big bear market, which I don't know if we'll ever have again, instead of these little 20% dip and rips. Uh, but you would think at some point um, we do. So um, there's a question of how these fit into the Trinity ETF and strategies. You know, Trinity, for those who don't recall, we have three allocation funds. On one end is buy and hold, that's GAA. On the other end is GMOM, which is pure momentum and trend. And Trinity is the merging of the two, the yin yang of, of global buy and hold and global trend. Um, so the, the buy and hold by definition has global stocks in which, you know, they're broadly the proportions they are in the market cap with value tilts. And then Trinity um, also has the momentum component. So those come in and out over time based on what's favorable. We all know everything's going up. <laughs> Most of uh, all the equity markets are going up. Uh, real estate, not particularly participating. Fixed income, not participating. Commodities depend who you ask uh, and what's going up, but um, but it's definitely a romping, stomping bull in all sorts of equity markets. Um, <clears throat> okay, TYLD. Let's take a hard pivot. If you guys have more questions on the shareholder yield suite, certainly reach out to us uh, and or um, our, your uh, local salesperson or myself, anyone here. Um, we're located in Manhattan Beach. We've got a new office. You guys come say hi. I'll be in Col If anybody's in Colorado next week, we'll be in Colorado Springs at the Future Proof Retreat. Uh, and then the following week in New York City. I haven't been there in a long time. So excited to see my New York friends. Uh, again, drop us a line if you want to say hi. Let's talk fixed income. Let me get a swig of tea and water real quick. So we just wrote a paper 
phrase we were using a lot last year, as was everyone else, um, where for the first time in a long time, we have yield again. I mean, my gosh, what a weird period for a long time where we had 0% fixed income yield. Some places they were negative. I think I feel like I talked about this ad nauseum on the podcast, talking about what a weird time, fixed, negative fixed income yields. Uh, and for it had all sorts of knock-on effects. One of my favorite papers that no one liked uh, was one about how stocks were allowed to be expensive because bond yields were low. We certainly had that uh, phrase being uttered all the time, which oddly enough, we don't hear anymore. We don't say stocks are no longer allowed to be expensive because bond yields have ripped up five percentage points. Anyway, but I've, I've talked a lot about fixed income over the years. And um, from someone who's kind of a value, out of favor, distressed, I'm attracted to that sort of opportunity. Um, I like margin of safety. I like buying things on the cheap. Fixed income for me has always been a curiosity because bonds, you know, can go down a lot and they have over time. Um, and kind of before this, this interest rate rip up, um, we've certainly had those periods. Now, this is going to be talking on a nominal basis, but on a real basis, bonds are equally as risky as stocks. So they've gone down 50% uh, across the board, including T-bills. Okay. But, but thinking in terms of this world where last year, I feel like the big word cloud was T-bills and chill, right? You got 5% all of a sudden out of nowhere, retirees celebrating, pina coladas. Um, I'm going to have my passive income sit on the beach. God, you know, God uh, bless it. I, I'm, uh, I'm reached the promised land of Valhalla. Uh, but I feel like if you were to tell me um, next year that stocks were down 20, 40, 60%, I would say people are going to be losing their minds. Twitter is going to be losing their minds. Advisors, clients can be losing their minds, um, which I think we would all agree with. But then I say, well, you know, what about an asset class that's probably as large on most portfolios, bonds? I say most bond indexes and funds are down 20, 40% and some more. And no one's losing their minds, which I said is a bit of a curiosity. But We've long scratched our head about bonds. We wrote this paper called T-Bills and Chill most of the time where we said, you know, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. And this is my hypothetical description where, let's go back, um, where if someone came up to me, like I love using the, the Ben Graham, Mr. Market analogy. You know, someone comes to you every day offering to buy and sell stocks. You can turn them away every day. And so I say, okay, let's hypothetically say you got T-Bills at 5%. And let's say someone comes up to you and is like, all right, I got junk bonds, 5%. Are you interested? You say, no, why would I buy junk bonds at 5%? I can get T-bills at 5%. Go away. They come back the next day and they're like, all right, here's what I got for you. Junk bonds, 3%. And you say, are you crazy? I just told you no at 5%. Why in the world would I buy a riskier bond at a lower interest rate uh, coupon than I can get a T-bills? Go away. They come back a week later and say, okay, I thought this over. You're right. 10%. Are you interested? And you say, well, yeah, maybe. Actually, that seems interesting. I'm getting a pretty decent compensation for buying these uh, lower quality bonds. And then maybe come back a week later and say, oh my God, sorry, just got divorced. I got to get rid of these 15%. Here's some bonds, 15%, junk bonds. Would you be interested? They say, yeah, probably. Okay. But that's what happens in markets. Okay. And you have all of these various fixed income markets that trade at yields, historical spreads relative to T-bills. Now, we got uh, 100 plus years of bonds in the US um, and then some that are, are more recent. But even if you're looking at, say, the US bonds, government bonds, here's the yield curve. Normally, it doesn't look like this, right? This is what's called an inverted yield curve, uh, what a lot of commentators say um, has been one of the longest, if not longest in history, where you have these short-term bonds are yielding more than long-term bonds. And that's not normal. It happens. It's happened plenty of times but it's not the norm, okay? And so um, ignoring kind of the path of interest rates and everything else going on, you know, you can buy uh, these short-term bonds and, and kind of guarantee yourself this higher yield. So uh, if you're buying a 30-year bond, are you hoping that um, yields come down? You know, that they go up, you're going to get in a lot of pain. Anyway, the spread is negative for most of these, for the longer yielding bonds, when historically it has been positive. And you can do this not just for, uh, you know, the, the term premium, you can do this for credit premium and all these other premiums. The academics love to talk about with bonds and all sorts of different types of uh, compositions. So you got everything from, here's a chart, 
with historical, some of the current and average yield spreads for all sorts of stuff. We got high yield and mortgage back and emerging markets and corporates and ags and blah, 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 blah right? But for the most part, um, it doesn't make any sense to me, and we ran some quantitative simulations, to be buying these riskier bonds when the spread doesn't compensate you. So in this paper, we said, what if you just bought the 10-year when it was in the top half of history? So no look-ahead bias, only up to that period in time. And historically speaking, it was a smart idea. You ended up with you know, similar higher returns, lower volatility and drawdowns. Uh, you know, and doing the opposite, buying when the spread was in the lowest half of history was a terrible idea. It's like buying expensive stocks. Like sometimes does it work out? Sure. But on average, it's an absolutely horrible idea. So anyway, you can look at this whole universe of bonds and say, um, here's what we're going to do. And so TYLD is a fund like, I, I've never seen a fund like this. So it could be that it's a totally idiotic idea. And we crafted this thing that nobody wants or understands, but to us, it makes a lot of sense because if you look at a broad um, ag, it, you know, most people that do bonds do one of two things. They buy U.S. government bonds and they may do a ladder. So they could either be all in T-bills or maybe they buy a ladder, they buy a bond fund, U.S. government bonds. I'm going to buy five year, 10 year, 30 year, whatever. Or they buy something like the Barclays Ag, which, you know, maybe half U.S., a quarter, uh, you know, agencies, mortgage backs, a quarter corporates. Um but what we said is, why don't we just T-bills and chill? So the default is sitting in T-bills. But when the spread is wide enough, so let's say like the top third of history, we'll opportunistically move into any of these categories. So this is a rules-based strategy. Um, it's tactical. It looks at a lot of different types of risks. So it's not just U.S. term premium. We got credit in here with corporate bonds and junk. We got high yielding bonds. Um, we got uh, mortgage back emerging market sovereigns. We even have a couple of quasi bond things like REITs and TIPS, on and on. But guess what? You know how many of these are signaling and buy signal right now? Zero. So right now, this portfolio is 100% in T bills. Um, and it, it's like, I think it's in the teens now on, on AUM, it's over 10 million. Um, but, uh, but again, because it's below 50, it's currently 0% expense ratio. Uh, we don't have a slide on that. Um, but, uh, but this fund will opportunistically move into these as things blow out now. So right now, this is why this fund to me is so interesting. One of two things has to happen or one of three things, either T bills, the yields need to come down for some of these to become interesting. All of these bond markets, the yields need to go up. I mean, REITs, if you look, and we manage a REIT fund, um, you know, REITs, historically speaking, a lot of these have big fat spreads relative to T-bills. REITs, you can also compare to TIPS, um, which is an interesting metric on, on when REITs look better um, relative to TIPS. But um, most of these, it's saying, hey, there's not enough juice there yet. So uh, either all of these yields need to come up. And often, by the way, a lot of these tend to happen at the same time. You know, they kind of um, often will move together or both needs to happen. T-bill yields come down, long-term bond yields come up. Um, either you guys stopped asking questions or I just don't see them anymore. There was like 30 questions and now there's zero. <laughs> so um, let me know uh, if you guys uh, have some more Q&A. Um, I'm going to hit pause on this. We'll run through the disclaimer slides, and then we will um, start to uh, uh, just do an open-ended Q&A. So you guys can ask anything you want until the time runs out, um, and we'll uh, we'll talk about whatever you have on you guys' mind. Um, and I'll, uh, I'll I hopefully can just answer some questions uh, uh, as they come in. Um, somebody wants to know if we're going to uh, launch something with the ticker Meb. Uh, it's funny, Matish. Uh, um, we have that ticker, actually. Um, we have a couple of tickers that I think are um, interesting, but probably uh, are not a fit for funds. Um, you know, we like to, we have four uh, criteria when we launch funds. You know, the first is hopefully it doesn't exist. So I don't know there's anything like TYLT. Howard Marks kind of sort of is like when distressed markets happen and bonds blow out, he, he'll launch funds. Like that makes sense to me. But it's not to me, to me, totally systematic. Um, so I think it's opportunistic. You know, we hope it doesn't exist. And because I don't want to be like, you know, Vanguard's got 0% market cap weighting done. Like we want to be in the dark corner of the world where it's an exposure that 
no one else has. We do academic practitioner research. So there's a question on, has there been a back test on this fund? There's been a back test on the broad theory, right? So it's called T-bills and chill. Most of the time you can find it on the website. If not, we can send it to you. Um, but, uh, but again, like most of our research and writings, uh, they're meant to be instructive, educational, broadly describe to you what's going on with these fun concepts rather than fun specific, uh, type of, uh, experience. Um, uh, you know, TYLD is really looking, uh, quarterly. This is a slow moving type of fund. Usually these type of things, uh, credit events, um, geopolitical events in the fixed income markets take a while to play out. Um, and it's something ideally we would want to be invested in most of these markets, right? We want to be diversified across all these fixed income sources. We want to be earning risk premia, but only when it makes sense. It's like buying uh, stocks and looking at the broad stock market when it's trading at a 50 PE. It's like, all right, well, should we be buying stocks in December 1999 when the U.S. stocks are the most expensive they have ever been? And this happens in history. So like U.S. stocks right now are around a 35 long-term P.E. ratio. Expensive, but not a bubble. You know, we mark things above 40. But it starts to give above 40 and then certainly even higher, 50 on up to Japan in the 80s, which is 95. And it doesn't really pass the common sense litmus test to me. It's like, why would you buy stocks at a 90 P.E.? That's crazy. Um, but ditto with the fixed income is like, why would you buy risky bonds at lower yields than T-bills? Like that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So quarterly, we'll be looking at this. Um, but again, if you look at a lot of these yields right now, they got to move not just a little bit, a lot bit uh, to make it uh, into the portfolio. Um Bunch of questions, similar questions. Uh, if if multiple sectors blow out at once, how would they allocate? Um, so there, it's sleeves across all of them, and they're not exactly equal weighted because there's a couple that are harder to allocate to. So we'll use ETFs for those. That'll be a smaller percentage. Um, but on average, you would look for them to be roughly equal weighted for about the eight main ones. Um, and, and these are bonds. These are super liquid. Um, and we're pretty excited about uh, the opportunity. If it ever did happen, <laughs> we'll see. And by the way, you guys can ask questions about anything and we'll get to them. Wahoos or Rams, come on. Wahoos, don't be silly. Uh, uh, underdogs though. So two and a half points tonight. Um, again, individual bonds, REITs or ETFs. It's mostly individual bonds uh, and REITs. There'll be a couple ETFs, um, but uh, um, could it have 100% weighting and one fixed income? No, I mean, T-bills. It could be in T-bills 100%, but otherwise it maxes out on like, um, uh, you know, that sort of 10% range. Any plans to get Cambria ETFs on LPLs, no transaction fee list? Sure, request it. Let them know you want it. And the same with all y'all who are on platforms. Um, we're, our funds are mostly available everywhere now. Uh, Merrill was the last holdout, but we're, I think, to my knowledge, we're available everywhere. Europe's a little different story. Um, but if you guys don't have access to something, don't talk to us, request it from your home office. Uh, they love to hear from you. Uh, and certainly it'll be um, uh, added in the future. We're at two and a half billion now across 14 funds. So no longer a, a tiny, um, tiny shop anymore. Um, hey, I haven't heard you talk about it in a while, Meb, but you still got your personal money in Trinity. Yeah, you know, um, I'm, I don't, on my personal, I believe personal public investments should be set up. You have a plan, write it down. And you could probably forget about it for 30 years. You know, I'm, I'm not a big, big meddler. So I try to put all my public stuff on autopilot. Private's different. We talk a lot on the podcast about private investments and farmland and startups for, for public. Uh, Trinity works for me. Um, and it's been, uh, you know, there's plenty of different things that work for different people. But uh, the Trinity concept certainly resonates um, for, for me personally. Um, trend following, which we didn't talk about today really at all, um, has been in the news quite a bit uh, over the past couple of years. Um, despite not having a long bear market in U.S. stocks, trend following has been a, a, a pretty positive contributor. And I, I stand by the fact that I think that to a traditional portfolio, there's nothing better you can add than trend following, particularly when things go sideways or down. But as as the returns of some trend followers in February are, are demonstrating, uh, you can um, there's always a bull market somewhere. And if you look at the returns of cocoa, uh, as well as other commodities, there are certainly drivers of performance for a lot of trend following managers last month. 
What are your thoughts on commodities? You know, commodities is a pretty um, diverse bucket. We um, we believe in commodities as a portion of uh, asset allocation, both strategic and tactical. Um, most of the broad commodity uh, markets tactically have not been participating on average. So ag, space, energy, precious metals. Precious metals, gold hitting all-time highs, news slowly sort of becoming eclipsed slightly by um, Bitcoin, uh, you know, going to also all-time highs. And um, our Global Momentum Fund has and can own both, uh, GMOM, GMOM. And so by definition, Trinity, which is roughly a 50% allocation to that strategy, uh, can also own both. You can always find the holdings updated daily online, cambriafunds.com, uh, with, uh, with what we own. Um, I'm not a 60-40 person. I don't think bonds are without risk. They're definitely not without risk. If rates continue to rise, you know, I think that's probably the one big uh, unaccounted for risk in markets right now. I, I don't think if there was a ticking up in inflation that markets would deal with it particularly well. Uh, but we have seen that um, oil and other uh, sort of commodities have been ticking up. I mean, obviously, we mentioned gold and Bitcoin, but other commodities are starting to inch up. I drive an electric car, but here in LA, I mean, the gas is six and change. So, um, you know, I, I think TYLD, theoretically, I mean, you're getting 5% yield, but um, opportunistically, if things blow out, you get exposure to these markets, which I think um, is nice because, you know, look, if something hits the fan, whatever it is, election goes sideways, AI starts taking over a country, you know, whatever it may be, you know, and corporate junk bonds shoot up to 15%, you probably are, don't emotionally want to be buying them. It's like buying stocks when, you know, March of 2009, like emotionally, you probably don't want to be buying them. So the nice thing about these systematic strategies is they make that decision for you. Uh, for better or for worse, but I think for better. Uh, will there be overlap between our factor-based read fund, VLDG and TYLD? Uh, almost nil. Um, if TYLD does allocate to REITs, it'll max out at like 10%. So um, you wouldn't see much, much overlap. And, and BLDG is 60% US, 40% foreign. Uh, and it's done a pretty good job uh, as well. Any Cambria approach to biotech on the to-do list? You guys know I have a biotech background, so maybe one day. Um, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, TYLD and model portfolios. Is it a multi-sector bond fund, a fair comparison? You know, I think TYLD, you can think about it um, either as a replacement for like a BND or AG, where... Um, over time, you'll get similar exposures and returns, I think, uh, hopefully with lower volatility and drawdown. I mean, currently, it's a pretty large drawdown that's happening as we speak. So I don't know if that drawdown will continue and get worse. Um, but uh, but historically speaking, I, I think it gives you an element of protection against the drawdowns because of the yield cushion. Um, you could also use it as a T-bill um, replacement. Obviously, it's not going to be nominally risk-free like T-bills are, but it will be on a real basis, I think, in line or better than T-bills. I mean, the way I think about it, and again, you got to be really careful in my world of uh, you know what you say and what you promise and what you guarantee, and we like to hopefully under-promise and, and over-deliver. Um, but to me, this fund in my mind, I think of it as a T-bill-like fund that hopefully will get another 200 basis points on top of T-bills over time for totally reasonable amounts of volatility and drawdown. Future is always going to be different. You obviously can't guarantee that. That's my hope and expectation um, for what this portfolio can do. And hopefully it has a lower vol than ag or um, certainly the long-term type of bonds, 30-year uh, as well. Um, and you know, will will uh, will this replace some of the funds in Trinity? Um, I believe so. Uh, maybe not all of them, but some of them. Um, we're winding down on questions, you guys. So if there's anything burning on your mind, uh, get it in before uh, this closes down in a few minutes. Um, again, you can come see us in Manhattan Beach. Uh, it's beautiful. We'll be in Colorado, New York, um, hopefully some other places this spring. If you want to, uh, you know, myself or any of the team to come to your town. Uh, give us an excuse, reach out, say, hey, uh, we'd love to host you 
um, or uh, come on down and say hi to us uh, whatever, for whatever reason. Talk funds, talk macro, come down for a festival. Let us know. Um, go see a baseball game. Uh, so uh, I'll, add, I'll answer a couple more of these and shut it down in about seven minutes. Um, again, follow up on email if you guys um, are too embarrassed to ask something or uh, uh, too shy uh, if there's something on your mind. Um, hey, well, this is the first time we got a leverage question today. Uh, is there a way to leverage you know, th these funds like your shareholder yield funds with something like futures? No. Um, you know, I, there's a lot of ways to concoct leverage. You can explicitly use things like options or futures, or you could leverage on your own balance sheet. Uh, but in general, we find that most investors can probably do without, like, you know, I think if, if we all look back in 30 years and say, man, you know, I really wish I'd gotten a 9% return instead of 8% return. I, I don't think any of us would say that. Um, I think we would look back and say, man, you know, by shooting for that 15% return, that was one hell of a lot of volatility I had to endure. And that was so painful going those, those periods of massive volatility. So I think people often uh, think they can handle a lot more leverage involved than they can. My, me personally, I try to err on the side of uh, higher quality, lower vol if I can help myself, which is some of the, the value exposure. Um, but if you want it, go get it. And, you know, particularly if you're young, uh, perhaps, uh, Perhaps you can handle it. Um, and for those who join late, sure, um, we're, we're going to re we recorded this and hopefully uh, can share it once compliance blesses it um, in the coming days and weeks. Um, oh, and we got a question of FYLD. You know, it's got a 20% plus weighting on Japan with the recent DOJ action. How do you think this will affect the allocation moving forward? I don't know. <laughs> you know, I'm, I don't, all these geopolitical uh, events are always curious on how they'll affect, you know, um, FYLD. It's interesting in Japan is always such a fascinating use case where, you know, they're hitting new highs for the first time in 30 years. This isn't some backwater economy. It's a top three global economy and stock market. Uh, at the time it hit its peak in the 80s, it was the world's largest stock market like the U.S. is today. Um, but you've seen a very real uh, shift in corporate governance and how companies in Japan treat shareholders, uh, both through the dividends and buybacks. Buybacks have been an increasing area of focus, uh, the name and shame area of Japan, where uh, these companies with low price to books, they get, you know, shamed. And Japan uh, has a different approach to that than the U.S. does. I think you try to shame CEOs in the U.S., they wouldn't care. But uh, Japanese is definitely a different culture. Um, so we're very positive, uh, objectively speaking, on Japanese stocks. And I um, think there's a lot of potential there, certainly cheaper on average than a lot of uh, U.S. Go Wahoos, I hear you. Um, in your EYLD fund, are you still holding Russian stocks? Yeah. So this is interesting. You know, EYLD has been a um, very strong performer versus the broad indices and the category. It's a five-star fund, particularly given the fact that it held something like 12% in Russian stocks when they got pause. Now, Russian stocks trade elsewhere, just not in the US. And if you were to extrapolate the value on those, if and when they trade in the US again, and hopefully uh, there's peace in Europe, peace in Asia, um, and those trade again, they certainly can't, they're marked at zero on the net asset value. And that's true for every ETF mutual fund you can find. Um, they can't be worth less than zero. And so at some point, that is a potential call option on Russian stocks and whether that's worth 20, 50, 70 cents on the dollar, or whether it's worth one, two, three dollars relative to where they went out at um, TBD. We'll see what happens with that. I don't think it's a reason specifically to buy a fund like EYLD. I think the investing methodology and the current stocks it owns speaks for itself, um, but potentially who knows when this may ever happen, 2024, or 2028. Uh, if Russian stocks trade again in the US, um, that could be a potential strong tailwind for that fund. For any fund, 98% of emerging market funds held Russian stocks. Um, we just held a lot more, <laughs> for, for, unfortunately, but maybe fortunately in the future, uh, we'll see. All right, you guys, questions are winding down. So um, 
Have a wonderful afternoon. Look forward to March Madness. Look forward to seeing you all in the real world. Uh, reach out at any point. Uh, tune into the podcast for some more updates. Uh, and if you have some more questions, firemen, info at cambriainvestments.com, uh, info at cambriafunds.com. Uh, email myself or the team, and we'll love to continue this conversation offline and, of course, in person. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody. Good investing.